good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks to those who have just joined us as well uh, on the internet. So my name's Rick Short, and I am the research manager at the NDA. Um, and this is uh, a webinar concerning the uh, NDA's uh, bursary call for this financial year. Um, so this is an annual PhD bursary call um, where we basically set aside around about half a million pounds to fund uh, PhD projects um, each year. Um, and we do that in a number of different categories. Um, so if we can go on to the next slide, please. Um, so there we go. Uh, the categories that we're, we're going to be supporting are, are listed there on the slide. Characterization, waste packaging and storage, uh, land quality, decommissioning, and spent fuel and nuclear materials. Um, and uh, we're going to have, uh, based on last year's feedback, um, a, a webinar on each of these uh, different categories. Um, and that's, this is just giving us an opportunity to um, help you guys understand uh, more uh, what we want from um, the proposals that come in um, and to give you guys a chance to ask uh, us questions as well um, around about the specific topics. Um, so we can move on to the next slide. There we go. So I've actually covered most of that there. Um, we're doing these webinars based on the feedback that we got last year, uh, which which was from the people who were judging the the, um, the uh, applications that we got in. That in in some cases they weren't always hitting the spot, they weren't always aligning with the uh, uh, the needs of the industry um, and and the things that we wanted to see out of the proposal. So hopefully this is going to give us uh, better alignment to the proposals um, with our with our research needs. Um, and as I said, it gives uh, you as academics the opportunity to ask the technical experts questions as well, um, and that will help you uh, write better proposals. Uh, so if we can move on to the final slide. Uh, the schedule um, for these um, webinars are going to be, we're going to give about 25 minutes of technical presentation, um, and that should leave us half an hour for questions at the end, um, if we have uh, that many questions. Um, if you're thinking of questions as we're going through technical detail, um, you can type those questions in. Um, I think by the looks of it, most of you have found the way to do that already, um, but you'll see in the top right-hand side of the screen, there's a, uh, a small speech bubble symbol. If you click on that, um, that'll give you the um, option to type in a message at the bottom there, um, and you can type your questions in as we go along. Um, and uh, we think the best way to deal with, this, with these questions probably is to wait until at the end, the end of the presentation and we'll read the questions out um, and address them, address them one at a time. Um, please bear in mind when you're uh, typing the questions in that this is a public forum um, and so uh, please respect the presenters' um, decisions on as to whether or not they, they might uh, want, want to not answer some of the questions or or, or give a very sort of uh, redacted answer, if you like, um, if any of those uh, questions are based around sort of sensitive um, subject matter. Um, please also bear in mind that this is our first go at doing this. This is the first time we've done one of these webinars before, so um, you know we may have some uh, teething problems. Uh, please bear with us if that's the case. Okay. Uh, so uh, we're going to go move on to uh, the first technical presentation now, which will be uh, Carwin Jones, and he's going to talk to us um, about the spent fuel side of the um, of this particular thing. Thanks very much, Rick. On its formation, the NDA inherited responsibility for the management of a variety of spent fuels two largest types, at least in terms of material quantities, are Magnox fuel, um, uranium metal, clad in magnesium alloy, and AGR fuel, O2 fuel, clad in stainless steel. Uh, in addition to those, there's a, a smaller but much more diverse population of fuels, which are sometimes talked about under a um, generic term of exotic fuels and this, this covers all the variety of materials from prototype and you know, research reactors that are operated in the UK. Um, in terms of NDA strategies for the management of the spent fuels that it's responsible for, well, 
Historically, Magnox fuel and AGR fuel have been reprocessed at Sellafield in their respective reprocessing plants. And the future strategy for Magnox fuels is to continue to operate the reprocessing until all that fuel is reprocessed. Whether or not a small quantity of Magnox fuel might remain when the Magnox reprocessing plant stops operation is, is, is somewhat uncertain. And if there is a small amount left, it will, in some respects, perhaps best be regarded as joining the inventory of exotic fuels. For AGR fuel, which has to date been reprocessed in the thermal oxide reprocessing plant at Sellafield, the, the strategy is to continue to do that, um, along with reprocessing uh, contracts for foreign light water reactor fuels until the Thorpe plant shuts in around about 2018. AGR fuels will continue to arise past that day, continue to be discharged from the stations for quite some considerable time, well into the 2020s. And after Thorpe ceased operations, the AGR fuel will continue to be received onto the Sellafield site and, and will be stored there pending eventual disposal to a, to a deep geological repository. In terms of exotic fuels, NDA's strategy for those is to is to take advantage of reprocessing where that's that's practicable and profitable. And, and there have been some examples already of um, some of the exotic fuels being reprocessed through the Magnox reprocessing plant, uh, where where it isn't either either viable or not not profitable for various reasons. The, the strategy is to is to render those exotic fuels into a form that's suitable for safe and secure long-term interim storage and, and eventual disposal. So in, in summary, the, the, the strategy in place for the management of the spent fuels that NDA is responsible for, and there are plans for implementing those strategies, and there are also appropriate contingency measures in place or being put in place to, to manage, manage uncertainties and risks associated with that. There's a requirement, though, still for you know, for variety of R and D, and I'll, I'll go on to talk about the where, where the needs arise from in a little bit more detail. But but it might be summed up by saying that the R and D needs are, are really relating to the uh, underpinning the existing strategies, improving confidence in the management of the contingencies, and improving and enhancing our understanding of alternative options for storage and and, and or pretreatment of materials for disposal. Next couple of slides show the descriptions of the topics that were put out in the first recall under spent fuels. I'll talk about these in some more detail in a little while, but this, this just gives a, at least a first flavor for the kinds of things that uh, the NDA is interested in. Um, in terms of AGR fuel, the the majority of the, uh, the interest arises from the somewhat unique characteristics of AGR fuel, like, like water reactor fuels and coming around the world, the, the stainless steel cladding of, you know, of AGR fuel makes it somewhat of a unique case. Um, and a, a portion of AGR fuel that's discharged from the reactor, which is irradiated under certain temperatures, certain conditions within the reactor, becomes become sensitized to, you know, to corrosion as a result of a process known as radiation-induced segregation, where chromium becomes depleted at the grain boundaries of the, um, of the cladding and, and renders it susceptible to corrosion under certain conditions. Um, and that, that leaves some, some questions about fundamental mechanisms of um, corrosion and inhibition of AGR cladding during its interim storage, wet storage in ponds. And, and those, we'll talk about those a little bit more. Um, dry storage is a, is, a, is a potential alternative to, uh, to, to wet storage in, in the longer term. Uh, but again, the, the, the nature of AGR fuel with stainless steel cladding means that there's, there's relatively little experience of drying and dry storing fuel of that type. And, and so there's there's a need for, for a better understanding of the 
and the fundamental behavior of AGR fuel under dry storage conditions. Also a couple of topics that, that were listed for damaged and degraded fuel, which forms a part of the exotic fuels inventory. Some of the material is, um, is material that's either been in deliberately degraded um, as a result of things like you know, PIE activities. And there's also a, a population of material comes under the exotics that's, that's become um, damaged and degraded as a result of, uh, of the way it's been handled or been, been stored in the past. And, and there's a variety of topics there that, that, that are of interest, most of which relate to methods that might be used for preparing those materials for interim storage and, and eventual disposal and, and what might need to be done to them to put them into a into a suitable state. So to explore some of those in a little bit, a bit more detail. Starting with AGR fuel, it will dominate the, the inventory of fuels in interim storage in terms of the quantities. The exact amounts uncertain because it, it depends on how long the AGR stations operate for and exactly how they operate. But the best guess is somewhere in the region of 6,000 tonnes of, of spent AGR fuel will need to be interim still at Sellafield for quite a considerable period of time. EDF disposals the year earmarks are beginning in 2075, so it's, 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 it's many decades of, you know, of interim storage needed for, for really quite a large quantity of fuel. Because of that, ensuring that the fuel is still safely, securely, sustainably, and in a cost effective manner is, is, is really a very important thing um, because of the quantities and the timescales involved. Now, AGR fuel has been been stored at, at Sellafield for quite some considerable number of time now, for, for several decades pending reprocessing. So there's, there's a good deal of, of practical operational experience in the storage of AGR fuel. M much of it um, successful and, and pointing to, to uh, giving a good knowledge of conditions under which it can be stored without any threats to the integrity of the um, cladding. But there have been a few problems along the way as well, which, which have also given some insight into the conditions under which the, uh, the cladding might become susceptible to, to corrosion and failure. The option for interim storage of the AGR fuel that's been selected is for it to be marshaled into the thought receipt and storage pond, which will be dosed to a pH of 11.4 with caustic soda. Um, that there's good operational experience of those conditions at Sellafield and some fuel has been stored in under those conditions for more than 20 years now without any indication of any um, corrosion or failure of the, of the cladding. Nonetheless, although there's that good practical operational experience of those storage conditions, that the fundamental mechanisms of, of corrosion and, and its inhibition the steel AGR cladding in, in pond storage environments. There's, there's still a there's still a good deal of uncertainty about what those are, and so, so some of the examples here of, of areas that, that might be of potential interest, and I should stress they are just examples, are questions like what what exactly are the fundamental mechanisms by which AGR cladding undergoes you know, corrosion in, in wet storage under certain conditions. We we, we know it's a form of intergranular corrosion, but there's lots of things that we don't know. Um, that we don't know for, for certain about the role of residual stresses in, um, in corrosion. Um, the corrosion seems to occur at limited sites, and we don't fully understand why that might be. Uh, we don't really uh, fully understand the, the mechanisms by which the corrosion is initiated in the first place, um, or exactly what's happening when the, when the corrosion is propagating. In, in terms of inhibition and, and the caustic conditions that have been chosen, um, we, although we have good practical experience that caustic is effective, we don't understand fundamentally exactly why that is and exactly what the caustic is doing in terms of either preventing the initiation of the corrosion and or slowing the propagation. As well as those fundamental questions about mechanisms of corrosion, that there's also potentially research that might be helpful in terms of practically managing the fuel in the ponds for, for prolonged periods of time. Um, 
as things stands at the moment, the first indication that, that would be given of, of any failure of, of, clad, of AGR clad enduring storage would be, would be detected by you know, seizing levels increasing in samples of pond water and that will be routinely analysed. But, but at the moment we have um, no, no immediate means to, to trace the source of the uh, failure amongst the 6,000 or so tonnes of fuel that will be in the pond. So if, if there are any means to provide early warnings of, of incipient failures of the cladding or to provide the means to trace the, the failures to their location in terms of exactly which fuel uh, is, is affected, uh, those will be, will be very useful things. Moving on to the interest in AGR storage. It may potentially, perhaps, be an alternative to pond storage for AGR fuel to, to bridge the gap to, to final disposal. If, if for any reason that like storage becomes or is judged to be um, unsustainable, but uh, there is very little experience of drying and dry storage of stainless steel clad fuels and providing the facilities to store 6,000 tonnes or so of AGR fuel and actually physically moving the fuel into such facilities is, is, is not to be taken lightly by, by any means. So that there's a need to, to better understand uh, the viability and the feasibility of uh, dry storage for AGR fuel and to understand exactly what it might mean in practice in order that we can, we can compare options and, and make decisions in a more informed way. So again, some of the examples of, of potential areas of interest, again, they're, they're just examples. We know that under, from PIE work, we know that AGR fuel can be susceptible to the intergranular corrosion when stored in air and the humidities fairly rapidly. But, but again, we, we, we don't really understand the fundamental mechanisms of what's going on when AGR cladding undergoes um, intergranular corrosion in in gaseous atmospheres containing water vapour. One of the many things that we don't fully understand is whether or not there's a threshold in the water vapour content of, of different gases and what those thresholds might be and why those thresholds exist if they do. And another example of things that we don't understand is fully at least is, is whether or not products of radiolysis reactions involving the, the storage gas and any, um, any contaminants like water vapour play any part in those corrosion mechanisms. Moving on to the damaged and degraded fuel, which forms part of the exotic fuels inventory. Um, there's a need to, to put that material into a form that's, that's suitable and appropriate for safe and secure and sustainable interim storage and also potential final disposal. Because of the diverse nature of the material, because of its characteristics and behaviours, because of the way it's been treated in the past, there's, there's a number of challenges it, it, it might present. And just one of those that I've listed there which tends to appear is, is where, where some of that material has been wet stored. There's, there's the possibility that it may be difficult to dry the material entirely and, and what, what effects the residual water uh, might have on its subsequent behaviour during storage, uh, in particular question there would be about radiolytic gas generation from radiolysis from any residual water. Again, some examples of areas of interest would be relating to how the fuel might be prepared for interim storage and or disposal and what steps might need to be taken or what options might be available for managing the, the characteristics and the behaviours of the material during that time. Um, those might involve things like how to Retreat the material to remove residual water. It might involve things like clever means of packaging the material to, to manage radiolytic hydrogen generation, and hydrogen absorption, or, or be what it may. So that, that was all I was going to say on, um, on spent fuels. I guess we'll hand over now for the nuclear materials uh, and take questions at the end. Okay. <laughs> You wanted to do questions for that particular presentation first, Rick, or move on to do 
um, both presentations and then questions and answers. Um, did we get any questions sent in during that presentation? There hasn't been any come in during. Okay, well let's let's crack on with the second presentation on nuclear materials and and uh, if people do have questions, as I say, please feel free to type them in while whilst the presentations are going on, and uh, we'll address them at the end of the presentation. Okay. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Rick Slater, and I'm fuel cycle manager at the, at the NDA. At the NDA, and over the next few slides, I'm just going to talk you through some of the areas of interest where we may may want some um, research work done to help some of our strategies. Um, so I will uh, explain those to you. Next slide, please. In the course of the reprocessing programmes, which have still got another few years to run, uh, by the end of reprocessing, we'd have accumulated about 140 tonnes of separated plutonium, which is uh, in the form of plutonium uh, dioxide powder. Um, that is stored in a variety of stores at Sellafield in um, effect effectively sealed packages, which are sort of Russian doll type um, compositions of stainless steel containers. Um, our baseline strategy is to store this material probably for quite a few decades, maybe as long as out into out to 2120. Um, so there's a need to understand what's happening inside those uh, plutonium canisters. Uh, we know that there's various effects that go on. There's pressurization effects due to radiolysis of water. There's helium evolution. Um, some of the material has got contaminants in it, such as chlorides, so there are corrosion mechanisms in place. So there's a whole raft of um, basic science understanding of what happens if you've got a can of plutonium powder and you choose to store it for 100 years. What kind of science issues do you need to understand? And we've already got some work sponsored um, looking at those those areas. Um, one of the difficulties that we find is that uh, our facilities for carrying out um, examination of these containers are limited. Um, some of them aren't available yet. And one thing that we would be really interested in is um, some work done on finding some sort of surrogate material that we could use as a proxy for plutonium to do experimental work. Um, one that's been used in the past has been cerium oxide, but there's limitations to that. And we'll be really interested in some, some work done that could um, identify some kind of surrogate we could use to do meaningful experimental work in a, a more readily accessible and less expensive environment than using plutonium active facilities. So that's sort of one of the spin-offs from the, the long-term storage um, regime that we, we might be interested in, along with the sort of fundamental science work on, on can storage. Next slide, please. We've been, we're working with Department of Energy and Climate Change at the moment, looking at what we're actually going to do with this material in the long term. And one of the options that's been um, looked at by government is should we try and reuse the material? And we've engaged with a number of different technology suppliers with a view to finding a, a means of reusing the material. Uh, one option would be to convert it into MOX fuel. Um, which is uh, a fuel derived from a mixture of, u of uranium and plutonium, and irradiate it in new build light water reactors that are being built in the UK. Um, using about four light water reactors, you could convert this material to MOX, and over a period of about 50 years or so, you could convert it all into spent fuel, um, store it for a few decades, and then disposition it to a repository. A similar proposal has been uh, put forward by um, CANDU in, in Canada. Um, you, you could convert it to MOX fuel and, and burn it in uh, CANDU reactors. You'd probably need about, if you had two CANDU reactors, you could burn it over about 60 years. If you had four CANDU reactors, you could burn it over 30 years. Again, you'd be producing a, a spent MOX fuel, which you would, you would dispose of in the GDF. And the final, um, offering that's come forward is from the from General Electric in the US 
um, who proposed that it could be turned into a metallic fuel uh, irradiated in a sodium pool fast reactor, several sodium pool fast reactors, and again you would produce a, a spent fuel product which you could dispose of um, in the geological disposal facility. Now we, we're looking at three sort of commercial offerings there. But there are sort of spin-off pieces of work which will probably be some scope for, for research being done. And there's various areas that we need to improve our understanding of, uh, particularly in terms of disposability in the GDF. Um, what kind of storage regimes we would use for the spent fuel, which may have to be stored for up to 100 years before you can put it in a GDF. And there's also maybe related bits of um, research work into um, looking at the merits of the, of the different MOX options, or, or maybe there's even an idea that we haven't thought up of yet that, that could be used to, to um, turn the material into a spent fuel. So the, there could be some spin-off work on, on reuse, and we're expecting to get some a sort of a policy decision from government maybe towards Christmas this year on which of those three technologies um, they think is worthy of, of taking forward for further development. And as I say, though it's going to be go, probably go to a supply chain company, uh, there's no doubt that there's going to be um, development work required to support any of those options if they get taken forward. Next slide, please. Uh, the other option that we're looking at is um, immobilization. Um, we may go down a reuse option, and even if we do, there's probably going to be a number of tons of the feedstock which isn't suitable for reuse and would have to be immobilized before it's put into the GDF. Equally well, there's still a possibility that all of the potential reuse options are um, decided by government as something that they, they don't choose to do, either due to the economics of it or the availability of a reactor operator to take MOX and burn it in their reactors. And a decision could yet be taken that it's all too hard to do and we need to come up with a credible means of conditioning it before we put it in the GDF. Over the years, we've looked at a number of different immobilization techniques. We've looked at cementation, which I think has been sort of dismissed because the volume of cemented waste you would produce would be very, you know, very large due to the low incorporation rates of plutonium in it. Um, we've looked at vitrification, which is a possibility, but probably quite an expensive means of dealing with it. Um, the one at the moment that we are likely to progress further work is hot isostatic pressing. Um, that's been sort of proved on a um, very small scale actively and has also been demonstrated using um, inactive rigs by NNL. And we see that as a, as a possible technology that, that could be developed. What we're really interested in, one of the problems with reuse is all of the reuse technologies require complex industrial plant to be engineered. And we see with immobilization, um, our aspiration is to come up with a process that would be as simple as possible, so that it's um, it's got different. You know, it's a more usable uh, approach, perhaps to reuse if if, if, if reuse is ruled out. Um, there is an outline sort of process for hot isostatic pressing that's been developed, but we think there's considerable scope for simplifying and making that a more a more readily deployable technology. And we're interested in further development work and research into how that might be achieved, so that the simplification of these processes. So as an example, if you look at the, the little diagram I've got in the slide, it, it shows um, plutonium mixed with some sort of um, inert matrix material having to be poured through small bore pipes into a, into a canister before you can actually press it. You know, maybe there's a better way of doing that. You know, it, this material is not particularly readily it's not, it doesn't flow easily. Maybe there's an easier way of filling the can. I don't know. There's the technology involved of how you get a can with that kind of material from a contaminated glove box environment out into um, a press machine, which you, you would want to try and keep relatively clean. What kind of, you know, how would you go about doing that? Um, and then there's, there's also um, work needs to be done on the actual waste product that's produced from that. 
and it produces a durable ceramic waste product which we think is going to be um, suitable to go in the GDF but we don't really understand are there any issues to do with any gas generation or other sort of mechanisms that may take place within the canister over time that we maybe need to, to have some further understanding of. So there's, we think to get from where we are now to have hot isostatic pressing as a, as a credible sort of industrial process, we've probably got at least five or six years worth of development work and I'm, I'm sure within that there's some scope for some to do some PhD related research on it. Next slide please. Um, the last area that we're interested in um, in terms of nuclear materials is, is management of uh, uranic material which is no longer required. Over the course of our sort of fuel program in the UK um, we've, we've generated over 26,000 tonnes of magnox depleted uranium which we, we're struggling to find any commercial outlet for. Um, we've also got over 21,000 tonnes of uh, depleted he uh, uranium hexafluoride product which has arisen from um, operations at enrichment plants over the years. So we've got uh, most of this is stored at our Cape and Earth site down in well, sorry, it's not our Cape, it's not our site anymore. It's stored at Cape and Earth down in, in Cheshire. And it takes up a lot of space. It's expensive to store. And we're having to invest large amounts of money to pay Urenco to convert the um, uranium hexafluoride tails into um, U308, uh, which we see as a, as a powder that's suitable for disposal. The baseline plan at the moment is that all of this lot will be put into the GDF. Uh, but that is, that is not uh, not particularly cost cost effective option, and we're very interested in any research or development work that could be done to find um, a more effective means of disposal of this material, maybe um, near a surface disposal or some other means of uh, dispositioning it without having to put it two kilometres underground at great expense to the taxpayer. Um, I think that's about all I've got to say on any rate. So there's a lot of it and there's the scope for coming up with a solution which could save many millions of pounds if, if somebody can develop something. So that, that's as much as I was going to say on the slides. So uh, we're, we're interested to hear from people if they've got any um, bits of work that could support us on any of those themes. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, we haven't had any questions come in um, during the presentation, but if anyone does have any questions now, um, feel free to to ask. Um, we have uh, Cow and Nigel, and um, it's safe to answer those for you on spent fuel or nuclear materials. I've got a question. Um, it's it's a big generic question. It's very obvious that. Uh, reprocessing or any 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 technology like that has been well and truly left out of all of these strategies. Um, is kind of where that's going to or any developments that is potentially going to sit just purely with private investors, so sort of completely divorced from you and and kind of on the same line. I, I guess a, a, a basic background question. So new build happens. Is that going to have any impact on you and this and this strategy? So, is 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 the waste fuel that's going to be spent fuel that's going to be generated from that just going to be for the, the people who are operating the plants to deal with, or is it going to be something that will have an impact on you as well? Does anyone want to take that question, or is it? It's Nigel Donaldson here, and I'm answering it with an independent view because I'm not part of the NDA, so uh, I'll give an opinion rather than a, a, a proposal. Uh, my view is that the current strategy is that um, for the foreseeable future, uh, re that there is no commercial requirement and no political uh, support to reprocess nuclear mm -hmm. fuel. However, um, things may change and therefore in the context of the fuel cycle, if work was done which provided a significant alternative fuel cycle concept which was a game changer 
in terms of managing fuel, recycling fuel, reducing the requirement for uh, new fuel feedstock for nuclear generation, then that may well be of interest. But in the context of the NDA currently, their responsibility is to uh, follow um, an agreed strategy to manage the exotics legacy uh, and to manage the uh, legacy of spent fuel from um, the UK's reprocessing to date. Um, the current government policy in terms of any new build is that the operators would store that fuel and at uh, some time in the future consistent with the decommissioning program uh, there are arrangements uh, in principle which will uh, enable the government to take ownership of that and, and uh, follow a strategy which at the moment is to dispose of it. So as I say, um, I wouldn't personally um, exclude uh, separation or recycle from the thinking. It may well be that separation or even transmutation technology could improve disposal uh, concepts for fuel. Um, but at this stage, it, it would have to be considered in the context of seeing whether this could be a game changer in terms of uh, management of spent fuel or nuclear materials. Yeah. I'd agree with that, Nigel. I mean, the, the current position is that uranium prices don't really make reprocessing economic. It's cheaper to just mine the stuff fresh, uh, put it through a reactor and dispose of it. But who knows what the economics of that might be in 20 or 30 years' time. If we, we, we really don't know. Yes, and, and clearly, if you came up with a completely different concept for separation uh, of materials and its um, production into some form which could be used in a reactor cycle, which was markedly commercially different from the current regime, then obviously people would start to sit up and take notice. Thanks, Nigel, and thanks, uh, uh, Mick, for those answers. Uh, there's a couple more questions that have come in um, on the uh, text box at the side of the screen. And the first one is from uh, Jennifer, and it's on um, how would the fire safety of spent fuels fit in with this? So I presume the, the, in the topic, in the context of uh, PhD research, any thoughts on that? Well, it, it, it's, it's bound to be an issue for dry storage, I would have thought. Um, but well, um, there has been a lot of work done on exothermic mm. behaviours, particularly of metal fuels and, and metal fuel residues. Um, and I'm presuming, possibly wrongly, that the fire safety is considered in terms of the material actually being the fire risk rather than the expectation that the material would be subject to fire. Uh, that may be wrong. Um, obviously, the, the fire safety of um, most of the ceramic-based fuels is generally something that is reasonably well explored, but I, I wouldn't exclude a proposal um, coming forward to consider some novel aspects of fire safety and, and behaviour of any sort of fuel. But it, it is important to note that quite a lot of work has been done, particularly over the last few years, uh, looking at the behaviour of uh, metal fuels uh, and in particular uh, things like uh, exothermic reactions, pyrophoricity of uh, fine materials and uh, hydrides. Mm. Uh, don't know, I mean, obviously, if that hasn't actually grasped the question, uh, fire a supplementary in. Okay. Um, James uh, Marrows sent a, um, a question or a point in there. Uh, on the uh, failure mechanisms of sensitised AGR cloud in wet and dry conditions. Um, Carwin, I don't know if you want to, to add anything about that, if you've got any any sort of general points. You... I, 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 I could say a little more 
I was supposed to try and fill in a little more of the detail. Uh, Hi, right, thanks. If you could, are you getting me on audio? It's James here. Yes, oh, yeah, James. <laughs> Yeah. Just, just, just to, the reason we're asking is just to check whether the interest is um, focused on understanding the mechanisms in a sort of material science point of view, or understanding the um, factors in the processing or fabrication or surface characterization. Just trying to work out what, where you want to be, because it's quite easy to specify a PhD in this area that we're digging into mechanisms, but I don't know how useful that would be to yourselves. It, it, it's really it's really all the factors that might influence the um, the behaviour of the cladding. So that might include some of the things you just talked about there. You know the condition and the metallurgy of the fuel cladding. Uh, it also is, is about the fundamental mechanisms of corrosion and inhibition in both wet and dry conditions as well. Uh, the, the, the basic underlying science is uh, all of those things is not is not fully understood. Did okay, that... that's really helpful. Yeah, I mean, if after this meeting uh, we can make contact uh, and then we yeah. get some ideas back and forth, um, that'd be quite fun. Yeah, by all means, yeah, yeah, that'd be very interesting. Yeah. Okay. Just for, for general interest, Carl, is it useful for me just to chip in on that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on, Nigel. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the understanding of um, failure mechanisms of AGR cladding is. Um, consistent at the moment with a sort of generic model, but we don't actually understand the detail of the mechanisms. So effectively, uh, what we do recognize is that uh, those penetration failures which have occurred in the past seem to be associated predominantly with, uh, in the case of wet storage, the presence of some chloride ions uh, they seem to take place in conditions where the cladding has been subject to certain temperature ranges uh, and also uh, subject to certain neutron fluxes, which have given rise to um, uh, chromium depletion at grain boundaries. Uh, but also, um, they are um, consistent in some instances, in, in many instances, uh, with certain zones of the fuel structure, the pin structure, which is associated with uh, stress cycling. Mm -hmm. Effectively, what we have is a situation where what we do is if we, we understand this sort of macro model of what are the key uh, apparent uh, contributors to penetration failures. But we don't actually understand the detail. Um, now, whether or not we will understand the detail is, is questionable, but we, we could do with having a better understanding, which gives us confidence as to the conditions which will uh, either limit or totally prevent failures in the future. Um, so, for example, we're told that there's something like 4,000 different types of grain boundary. Uh, don't ask me to enumerate or elaborate. No, no. Uh, I, could, I could try. <laughs> right. um, but also, um, you know, we don't understand why uh, certain corrosion mechanisms tend to simply passivate or, or, or uh, become sterile, such mm -hmm. that it, it, it's found that where penetration has occurred, um, there are potentially only single points of penetration or, or small numbers at the most of penetration points in a single pin. So the sorts of things that we'd be keen to do is to understand what are the key influences on the corrosion mechanisms that do occur? What could those key influences be? How might those actually uh, leverage uh, to an end result which gives ongoing corrosion or penetration. How mm -hmm. might that affect the kinetics? Um, you know, if, you, if you imagine what, what is the microenvironment, what, what could the microenvironment be within a crack or a pit? Mm -hmm. yeah, and, within, uh, yeah. and therefore, uh, how do the mechanisms that we found do limit corrosion, such as uh, use of a caustic environment in a, in, in a wet situation work and does that give us confidence that that condition uh, over many decades 
is likely to make corrosion something that we can effectively discount as opposed to consider well we might be just be at the cliff edge of either some sort of um, uh, latent period or some slowing down. Yep. Um, in the case of dry we're in a much less confident position in my view. Um, we have seen in laboratory conditions active fuel pins which have corroded very quickly apparently. Um, we don't have that macro model yet even within the dry context of what are the conditions of storage which would be successful uh, and what would be the key threats to a dry storage regime. I, I use dry in a relative sense as yes, yeah. far as um, you know, we don't know whether there is, as Cohen said, this, this threshold of relative humidity, which has sometimes been mooted at about between 15 and 30 percent variously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we don't understand that. We don't understand either, as, as I think Carwin inferred, whether the uh, storage gases that might be used in a dry storage environment, for example, to uh, promote uh, other acceptable consequences such as adequate heat transfer um, could have impurities in them which under radiolysis could themselves contribute to a different set of problems within the storage environment either in terms of um, damage to the fuel, um, damage to the fuel containment or, or even potentially uh, some form of additional release and problem of uh, uh, material from the surface of the fuel because one of the things that Carwin didn't mention is that a lot of the AGR fuel from commercial reactors is associated with um, surface deposits mm -hmm. of yeah. various carbon compounds, yes, uh, carbon materials. Yeah. So it, it, it's all those sorts of things. I've perhaps yeah. gone on a bit, but perhaps it's, it's given you an idea. No, it's fine. No, it's, fine. It's, it's where I thought it would be. I, I think, Myron, it would be good to follow this up later. I think we need to bring... Um, sitting down here, we've got most of the approaches to tackle that. We might need to bring in um, someone, ex-colleagues from Manchester or from Bristol, um, to, to throw in some of the uh, the corrosion aspects. But it, 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 I can think of some ideas which might be worthwhile doing, but I think we could have a... a, a a conversation offline or a meeting. Okay, so very useful. Thank you. Thanks, James. Uh, we've got one more question on there as well regarding the uh, plutonium surrogate um, matter that Mick, Mick alluded to um, earlier. Um, and the question is um, in looking for a plutonium surrogate, what criteria would be desirable? Mechanical properties, reactivity, redox chemistry, speciation, etc. Um, how would these be ranked or prioritised? I think we're interested in, in a surrogate that could cover as many of the bases as possible. Uh, I haven't really got a, an order of priority, but to give you an idea of some of the bits of work we've got ongoing at the minute where, where it would be useful to us is we, we, we need to be able to prove we can reduce the um, specific surface area of plutonium by million operations, so obviously physical properties are, are of interest to us. We're also interested in um, removing chloride contamination, so the chemical properties of, of how we could sort of disassociate chlorine contamination from plutonium would be useful to us. Um, so really, it, it, it's as many of the properties as possible because our desire would be to reduce the amount of plutonium active test work we have to do to the absolute minimum. And I think it's fair to say, Mick, as well, that you might there, there might be more than one Surrogate that you might Maybe, yes. There might be, one, one might be better for one thing, one might be better for another. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, where, where we've been at the moment is um, NNL have, have, have been doing work for us and, and they've suggested, oh, we could use cerium oxide instead. And we sort of said, oh, not too sure about that. How do we know it's going to give us representative results? So even knowing the limitations of what a, a surrogate may and may not be able to do for us would be useful. I think the stance we've taken at the minute is you know, we've sort of seen possibly a higher likelihood of it being of some benefit from a physical point of view, but we've been very sceptical about the, the chemistry side of it, but that may be, may, we may be incorrect with that. It's not based on any science, it's just based on a, a bit of a, a reticence and, and untrueness. I wonder whether some form of modelling might also be 
included in the mix. Possibly um, nitro, yes. Possibly with some concentration of surrogates, because one of the biggest problems I think we have in the industry is how do you validate the surrogate? And industrially, we've been bitten on a number of occasions mm. where historically it's been believed that we had identified surrogate materials, only to find out that in a true, yeah. fully operational and radiochemical environment, it doesn't quite work. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes, that's a very good point. So I think yeah, that I would see potentially almost a, a per preliminary stage here of the PhD bursary work of looking at potential surrogates, looking at what might characterise surrogates and, and putting forward uh, surrogate or computational mm. model options which might then yeah. be suitable candidates for subsequent attempts at validation in an, yes. uh, in an yeah. active environment. Yeah. Well, was, was there another point about the fuel fire Question on Mary. I think, that's um, a, I think I saw another comment on that clarifying what, what, what was asked. Um, I, maybe I maybe I'm not quite grasping the, the question, but it seems seemed like the, the, the same same question. Um as I say, if you know, if um, if anybody wants to follow up on any of these afterwards, please get in touch with the guys at NNL, and we'll we'll sort yeah. of try and get to the nub of the problem. Yeah, I mean, the, the comment is that it, it meant the fire safety of spent fuels. Uh, uh, there's nothing, uh, Jennifer, that actually springs to mind on that. Uh, I mean, fire safety has always been one of the key safety case criteria, uh, which has had to be um, resolved for satisfactory licensing of any step of fuel management and, and it will be true for disposal just as it is for um, reactor operations and storage. Yeah. Um, so nothing actually springs to mind that is novel, um, but if, if somebody comes forward with something that um, would potentially be of a business impact. And I think one of the important things about the PhD bursaries and PhDs generally is whilst um, we should be thinking very broadly about things, there needs to be some recognition that at some stage, albeit in some instances after considerable additional work and, and potential um, uh, development, there would be a foreseeable business impact of the work rather than it being uh, purely a, a a matter of satisfying curiosity. So I think it, it, there needs to be some sort of um, incentive that says if we did work on fire safety in this area, it would change the game. I mean, I'm sure the most, I know Magnox historically has been of interest from a fire safety point of view because, you know, he, he just can pose a fire risk under certain circumstances, but I'd be surprised if that hasn't been sort of looked at in some detail, really over the years? Yeah, I think um, the one area that may be of potential interest is to uh, is if you could characterize um, metal fuel behaviors as they dry out, as they go from the fully wet to a fully dry stage and understand better um, what might be the particular levers to pull operationally to maintain a safe environment against the uncertainties as to how oxidation uh, and other um, degradation take place. Yeah. Uh, but nothing really springs to mind that says we. this is an area of knowledge which is crying out to be populated. Yeah. Okay, well, um, I think that's it with the questions. Uh, is that your yeah, you, Lindsay? Yeah, we, we've got um, we've got a question here um, from um, Darren Lee. You wanna? Yeah, sure. Just it's, it's about establishing some boundaries, really. You talk about um, reuse of special nuclear materials, and I think all the the different. Um, avenues that were explored related to the, the nuclear or the radiological properties of the materials. 
is there anything that would be uh, considered still uh, feasible uh, by looking at the chemical properties of these materials? One of the big difficulties there, Darren, is you know, one of the, the handicaps is, 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 the, is the size of the world's stockpile of depleted you, if you know what I mean. And yeah. The material that the MDA is responsible for, the MDU and our MDU contaminated or cross contaminated tails are, I don't know, perhaps not such an attractive proposition as the large quantities of clean uh, depleted tails for enrichment operations, which are out for uh, the world. So there's so much of it, there might be so much of it can be made to spread all the way through them. Yeah, so I was looking at it more from the point of view of something that you know, could potentially generate everything mm -hmm. um, in a, a, a non nuclear capacity. So if that's not on the table, then, then that's fine. But, you know, some guidance would be appreciated. But. So, so I can't quite hear. Can you repeat the question? The, the sound's gone a bit strange at this end. I didn't really clasp your supplementary. Sure. Basically, what I was asking was to establish some, some boundaries with regard to the, the sort of applications for special nuclear materials. So we've considered the radiological properties and reuse as mocks and, 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 um, and fast reactor fuels and all this sort of stuff. Yeah. But is there any appetite, I suppose is the best way of describing it, for looking at the chemical properties of these materials rather than just their radiological ones? Um, you have to tell me what you I'm not quite sure what you what you what you're suggesting. Well, in the past, for, for instance, we, we, we did some work many years ago uh, looking at the catalytic properties of materials. That would be an example. Others may be in terms of, uh, of uh, electronic properties uh, of the materials and those, those, sorts of, uh, those sorts of things, really. Right. Because the thing about them is, is that they are incredibly interesting and versatile materials with regard to their electronic structure and it's it's some a, a, i would i think I, I would be sort of like fair in saying a, a very uh, uh ripe area for, uh, for 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 research but like i say if it's if it's not on the table then it's it's worth establishing at this stage so that people don't go down different avenues that uh, that are not really open to them it's a, it's a good question. I mean, the, for, for me, the the first reaction is the troublesome nature of plutonium means that you know, you've got a very big hurdle to jump to actually use it for something else. Because I think that is the bottom line of the question: is if we understood it better, could we use it for something mm -hmm. different? And the idea of 140 tons of dispersed plutonium being used as we used to use tritium in um, telephones for, uh, for opening the dial might cause a degree of concern. Um, but I mean, that's not to say that it, it couldn't be used for something else. I, I think it's just a question of, you know, where would you start? I mean, I, if there's sort of like niche uses for it then i'm sure they could be um looked into we'd have to have a look and see whether we, we thought it was something we were interested in or not i think where we where, where we sit at the minute is we see that this plutonium man has a problem that needs a solution so yeah, I mean, the, the, um, part of the problem is also the isotopics as well i mean plutonium for space batteries is, is clearly one alternative use but you know you're talking of a very restricted market and indeed only one particular area of work which uh, wouldn't actually consume much of the, the plutonium uh, stockpile. Yeah. Uh, what, I, what I would suggest as well is that um, for, from our point of view, from the NDA's point of view, one of the drivers for us funding the bursary scheme um, or one of the primary drivers is is, is maintenance um, and development of the key skills and capability that we need to carry out decommissioning of the civil nuclear liability into the future. So one of the questions we'll always ask in terms of when we're when we're judging the PhD proposals that we get in is is that going to help us with that part of the mission? Um, is it going to 
make the decommissioning, the task of decommissioning the UK civil nuclear liability more efficient, safer, um, and is it going to provide um, a you know potential future capability? So you'd have to think about whether it whether you think it fits in with that mission statement. Um, but also, if it doesn't fit directly with this particular category, even though it is dealing with um, nuclear materials, um, if you've got a novel application or you've got a, thoughts about novel applications um, that could potentially make a significant dent, if you like, in the in the UK's nuclear material stockpile, we'd always take applications through the open theme as well um, that might cover those kind of aspects. Yeah. Perhaps I could ask, make a question which might help. The, um, the, the dominant theme here has been to look at, uh, in the case of plutonium, the current policy of trying to use it for power generation and effectively likely toast it into a form yeah. which is very difficult to subsequently use for yeah. um, nefarious purposes prior yeah. to disposal. Um, has any consideration been given to whether being a relatively narrowly characterised feedstock, something like transmutation may be useful. Now, I'll wash my mouth out at this point because, um, I mean, I, I saw a programme last week with Jim al Yes, yeah, sort of yes, I saw I, that. I was yeah. a little bit surprised by his espousal to transmutation because I think Jim was in the audience some years ago when I gave a talk with Colin Zimmerman at Guildford at the University of Surrey on partitioning and transmutation, which highlighted the major problems of industrialisation of transmutation uh, for effectively what was a soup of materials mm. coming from uh, the, um, the, uh, the fuel cycle. But it, it did occur to me that if you've got a relatively narrow spectrum of materials such yeah. as the plutonium feedstock, has is there actually any value in very preliminary front end work to say could we actually change this material in a way which would be potentially much easier to industrialise yeah. than putting it through reactors? So you know, you, you, you put it through a pipe and you, try, you effectively convert it to something else at 35p a kilogram. I mean, I think we haven't done any work on that, Nigel, because we've been given a sort of uh, a, a driver of something needs to be done with this problem. In a, in, a, in a reasonable length of time, which we've anticipated to be over the next two or three decades. Right. Obviously, transmutation, you know, sounds as if it's something over a longer term than that. But I, I wouldn't rule out no. paying for a bit of work on that because, um, you know, our baseline philosophy is we've got to store this stuff for about another hundred yeah. years. If something came along. In that, within that time scale that offered a yeah. better solution, then it would be something that we'd have to take very seriously, yeah. I think. Because re reuse, it, it's, you know, it yeah. sounds very good and all that, but yeah. there's an awful lot of risks associated with yeah. it. You know, is the UK New Build Programme going to run forward on the time scale as we think it is? Are we going to be able, to, well, not us, but are, is somebody going to be able to persuade new build operators yeah. they want to burn mocks? There's all kinds of risks that, that make it um, not a foregone conclusion that's what we're going to end up doing. We may, may, may be sat here in 10 years' time looking, thinking, well, what else are we going to do with it? Yeah. So, I mean, just to balance the argument, don't think that I'm proposing here that transmutation is something that's been completely missed and is a great prospect. There are major issues, and, and my position in the past and is still currently, that in the context of an industrial process, um, you know, transmutation has an awful lot of barriers um, to overcome before it could be mm -hmm. sensible. Uh, however, in the context of something like plutonium, uh, I do wonder, and I'm, I'm sort of thinking aloud as oh. an independent, whether a revisiting of plutonium transmutation uh, physics would be worthwhile if only to identify that, yes, we've actually understood it, we've checked, we understand what the barriers are, and whether there would be any change in prospect if things have moved on. In yeah. other words, what, what's the gap analysis, which says, if you, if you had to transmute this spectrum of plutonium isotopes, mm. uh, 
how much control would you have to have of the physics to avoid producing all sorts of other things which effectively just supplant one problem with several <laughs> yeah, others. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you know, what effectively just to, to, to look over the landscape and make sure that nothing's been missed or potentially whether there are any opportunities which would be resolved if certain gaps could be managed in terms yeah. of the science. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks for that. Is there anything else from uh, from your end, Lindsay? No, um, I think that's everyone here. Yes, thank you very much. All right. Well, thanks everyone for participating and and um, and uh, and putting up with the um, the minor technical difficulties at the start for some of you. Um, but yeah, if, if anyone's got any further questions, then you know please don't hesitate to get in touch. Um, uh, the details are on the NNL website of how you can do that, um, and we'll endeavour to answer any questions that you come up with over the next few days and weeks um, uh, via those means. Okay. Lovely. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much.